And then the big shock was that she said, you have to stay uh, detained till the trial. And here I lost my shit. You know, because I was ready to come home, continue my education. And I closed the chapter with degrees. And it's crazy because every month when I say I'm going home, I always extend my stay. And the only time I actually wanted to leave, Lesbos was like, I'm not done with you yet. Hello, dear friends and damn givers. This is the Let's Give a Damn podcast. I'm your host, Nick LaPara, and this is the show where I sit down for meaningful conversations with people who saw something wrong in the world and gave a damn about it. I truly hope today's conversation gives you hope and pushes you to give more dams than ever before. Okay, my friends, my guest today is, drum roll please, currently waiting to hear if she'll go to prison for 25 years. That is not clickbait, my friends. That shit is very, very real. My guest today is Sarah Mardini. If you recognize that surname, it's because I had Sarah's sister, Yuzra, on the podcast a few weeks ago. If you haven't listened to that conversation, make sure you go and listen as soon as we're finished here. But don't go anywhere. Back to Sarah Mardini, my guest today. In this conversation, we talk about the refugee journey she and her sister made from Syria to Europe. We talk about how she was arrested on a bunch of made-up charges two years ago while she was helping refugees in Greece, and we talk about so much more. Friends, I'm so inspired by Sarah's life and work, and I hope you'll be inspired as well. So let's get right into it, shall we? You can reach me anytime and for any reason at hello at letsgiveadam.com, and here's my conversation with refugee, humanitarian, and damn giver, Sarah Mardini. Let's go. Sarah Mardini, welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Thank you for having me. Yes, you are a fantastic human, and I have so many questions for you today, so much that I want to dig into. First of which is, how are you doing during this pandemic? You are in Ber- you live in Berlin, right? Yeah, I do live in Berlin. Um, I'm doing well, actually. It wasn't that bad. Um, it's, uh, it wasn't unfamiliar circumstances. We, we lived it back home for so many years yeah. so, you know we weren't that it wasn't that flexible to fly or travel wherever we want so i was living like this for 20 years of my life so yeah yeah and 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 your experience probably is different when i have to i have to think about where people are when i ask oh how are you doing during the pandemic because germany um you have uh, more competent leaders than we have here in the u.s and uh things were taken more seriously right and And I don't know all the logistics. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. But I do know that yesterday there were um, a couple thousand deaths from the coronavirus here in the U.S. And there was one in Germany. And so that's just a picture of literally there was one in Germany. And so that's a picture of, uh, yeah, how how different things are, like how tense things might feel here is not as tense as you're going to feel them there because things were done differently, you know? Um, yeah, things were taken care of differently, right? What were the, I mean, I'm sure you don't live in the U S but you see things on the news. Like what are the differences that you're seeing between how things were handled where you are versus here? Do you see any differences? How how are you perceiving Mm. that? So I'm not really super aware of how the U S is dealing with it, but I know that there was a very serious measure has been taken in Berlin uh, and Germany in, in general, like, it wasn't that simple to travel from a city to another, for example. Sure. And within the same country, you know, that's that was super difficult. And also a lot of people, uh, like for the first three months, I was home. I didn't leave my home, which I was able to do so. Right. You know, the government was very strict. Once everybody home, they moved everything remotely very quickly. They moved the schools and universities as well. You know, they gave also time to people to prepare ready and prepare sure um you know clubs and all social places shut down all shops shut down literally the whole country like shut down for a week or two at the beginning and then again with the slow motion start yeah but more realistic ones and somehow i think people were responsible because in germany the highest number is for elderly people. Mm. Like Germany is known about that. Like for example, Sweden as well. So these sure. countries are known for that. And and German elderly people are not as like they could be tough on you in the street. And I think the I think the reason was was that 
we all stood up together and yep. we all worried together and we minded these people and the, the situation and there was a fast emergency response and all these questions were answered very quickly and then you don't have to look to another resource to answer your questions so you know one resource one headline and one information for was distributed for everybody i think that was you know, and no one wasn't really like the, uh, to put it that way. The not a state president cared about his borders, where Germany cares about their civilians. Yep. Yep. So they didn't need to tell us traveling not allowed. Yep. We knew it already. Yep. You know, we knew it that we don't have to step out of the house. We don't need the like uh, the German government didn't even say that borders were closed. People just didn't go so, uh, because they respected they respected their neighbor, right? And that's one of the frustrating yeah. things about. Um, I I grew up overseas. I've lived back in the U.S. for um, a good chunk of time now, a decade, decade and a half. And coming back, moving back here in my in my mid twenties, it was so frustrating, like getting to re re know America where I was born and then left, and it it was so frustrating because Americans are very very um selfish selfish there you go you said it for me like there's this there's this unhealthy you know america's all about freedom and liberty and i can do whatever the hell i want and there is a there's a healthy and an unhealthy way to live that out and americans have by and large not everybody but by and large grabbed onto the unhealthy way to do that where it's like you can't tell me what to do I'm going to do whatever I want, right? Whether it's guns or health exactly. or a pandemic or whatever versus what we see in these other countries, Germany, for example, and a lot of them are in, I mean, I love Europe for a lot of reasons. We've thought many times Ger Berlin actually is on our list because Berlin is a, an amazing place to raise families. We've thought so many times about expatriating for a few years. But one of the reasons is because there is such a community focus there. There are people like everybody Again, not there's it's not perfect. No place is perfect, but by and large, the the vast majority of people want to not only see themselves in their own and their family thrive, but they want to see everybody thrive because that's what that's where true happiness is, right? Like if you look at the list of like the happiest countries on the planet, none of them like we're the United States is way down on the list for happy countries, and most of them are in countries that did fairly well during this pandemic because they said. I'm going to put my, I'm going to put your needs ahead of mine. What's the best for the whole country, the whole city, the whole town. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to suck it up and we're going to do it. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to do it. And there you see those countries with small numbers at this point. And you see our country with, you know, we, we're just surpassing 200,000 deaths, which is insane. You know, six, seven, eight million people that have gotten it. Um, yeah, it's vastly different. It's vastly different. Yeah, yeah. And I think also to add to that, I mean, the diversity in the society. You know, uh, that I said this is selfish for me because I see it. At, of course, not everybody. I've, now people will be like, oh, my God, she's judging that way yeah, yeah. society. <laughs> Go for it. Whatever. Bring it on. Bring it on. Whatever, people. So, but no, what I see is also... I mean, when was the last time that the, the, the American society had some huge change? This was years and years. I don't even ever think it, it happened. You know, well, it was that society and it just grew. Yep. Um, but here, you know, five years ago, there was a huge wave of migration. Yep. You know, this year uh, and the years before, there was a black African people coming to, to Germany. So, mm -hmm. like, constantly changing. And then the LGBTQ society being on the table as a change maker, then the underground scene in Berlin. And then, so, you know, kind of, there's a huge diversity and then it's making the society grow bigger. And then exactly what you said, build a community because we are thriving on communities. You can be by yourself out there. So I think that is the huge difference. And the idea that everybody walks around thinking they, they, they do have it, which is, unfortunately it's not. America is not great. Yeah. And you, yes, you're carrying the passport and you can travel wherever you go, but this is not all about it. No. And for me personally, why I have this huge statement right now, you know, on the news, what's happening in Greece and what's going mm -hmm. on. Just go back a month ago when it was Black Lives Matter and there were riots in the U.S. and all the demonstrations. My social media was flooded with this very unexpected new 
activist who is over there sharing and sharing and sharing. Why? Because it's the United States of America. Yeah. But then now I'm like, where are you? Yeah. No one is sharing what's happening in Greece and no one cares and no one wants to. My own university, you know, my own friends and colleagues who is, have American backgrounds, I'm very disgusted mm. because it's not about fighting only for America. Yep. It's about fighting for those vulnerable in need. Yep. And then if you do not raise your voice for that, shut the fuck up. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you know? yeah. No, I totally agree. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's seeing yourself as a citizen of the world versus mm. your, what, what reads on your passport, right? Where you're from or where you've decided to make home. It totally changes. And I, I thank God that I grew up not in the U S and that I then spent a lot of time traveling the world because it made me very quickly realize I don't want to be the citizen of one country. Yes. I have to have a passport. I have to live somewhere. Um, but I want to see myself as like, you're my sister, right? Like, like, it doesn't work. This world doesn't get better if because the, the, the United States doesn't live on its own planet. Things that the United States does and that Germany does affect everybody, whether it's climate or whether it's uh, battles we choose to pick. You know, the United States is so f fucking selfish because they don't see that the stuff that they're doing with, you know, the fights that Donald Trump is picking with China and with all these other places. It's going to affect everybody, not just us. And it affects us poorly, but it also affects everybody. And there's, again, it goes back to that selfishness and that lack of thinking, that lack of, hey, what, like, I'm a citizen of the world, not just here. I mean, we're seeing it in all the rhetoric, especially the last four years. No president here has been perfect, but we have seen a more, you know, compassionate outlook on the world with other presidents, right? And, and this president seems to want to isolate this country uh, by you know, selling, selling a bill of goods that just isn't true, selling propaganda about this, this country and, you know, make America great again. We need to go back to what? To Jim Crow, to slavery, to when women couldn't vote? Like, what are we going back to? Germany, as you just talked about, is a place that is, you know, uh, imperfectly, but trying to look forward, trying to make progress, right? Trying to be progressive and inviting, you know, more people to the table, different kinds of people to the table for these conversations about, you know, how this country is going to develop and grow. And here it's like, let's go back, make America great again. It's like, fuck, like, that's wild, you know? And it, Can we go up? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, what I was yeah, exactly. Okay, let's, um, I mean, we're, we're going to, we'll probably work our way back into this conversation eventually because <laughs> it, it's, it's inevitable. You and I seem to be uh, probably, we're both rebels in our, in, our, <laughs> in our own kind of way. But so you live in Berlin, Germany, but you're not from Berlin, Germany. And so- I had the privilege of talking to your sister a few weeks ago on the podcast, uh, had an amazing time, uh, you know, sharing her story from her perspective, but you're going to have an, a completely different perspective. And so I'm really excited to hear, like, start by telling us, you know, before your work with refugees in Greece, before getting to Germany, where you are now, um, give us the backstory. Like you're not from Germany, you're from Syria and you eventually led this left Syria, which brought you and your sister onto the kind of international, you know, stage, you know, you, you, had, yeah. you had, you still have international spotlight, but there is like, we don't know these girls and now we do. And so take us back growing up in Syria. How was it? How did, how did you feel growing up in that environment? Because I think again, especially, okay, we're talking on nine 11, we're talking on September 11, pretty big traumatic day for the U S a lot of, um, it was a horrible day, no doubt, but a lot of, uh, xenophobia and racism uh, was uh, was built, was grown, was birthed out of this time in American history, right? And so now there are so many Americans that hear the words Iraq, Iran, Syria, blah, blah, and they forget that there's real people living there, real people with real lives. They forget that if you, one thing I brought up with your sister was, I've seen pictures of Syria, you know, from years ago. Beautiful. I mean, it still is a beautiful place, but it was so. I mean, people don't people think of Syria and they only think war. They think terrorists. They think this and that. That desert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just and, and they don't. I mean, literally, people Google Syria and beautiful mountain ranges. Just a, it's an amazing place, right? So tell me about growing up there. Growing up in Syria, I think one of the best things that ever happened to me. Not because I'm Syrian, because the person who I am right now. And what I represent and the way I represent it is because I was born there and mm. I grew up there. Uh, we were very lucky. Syria in general, let me tell you, we are kind of, we have a, 
first of all, in the map, Syria is in the center. And that's why was, was, it's always and forever going to be a target, a political target. Mm. Because from Syria, you can reach Lebanon, you can reach London, you can uh, London, Jordan. You can reach uh, Palestine. You can reach sure. Saudi Arabia. It was literally the middle, the bridge between all of, it's called the Bilad Sham. Uh, back, like, no, it's actually, yeah, the, the Sham lands, basically, which is yeah. Sham is coming from Damascus, the, the capital. We have two ways of saying it. We say Damascus and we say Sham. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, and it's, it means the frickle. Sham is the is freckle. Singular yeah, yeah, yeah. As a freckle. Got it. So you know how beautiful, like my city means a freckle on my body. So wow. And it's exactly how it is, Damascus. Um, and apart from the map, living in Syria, we were a balanced society, which I think we have over 27 religion uh, within the same country. Hmm. It was super balanced, you know? Yeah. I never, I never was questioned before the war. Or oh, even post the part war, what is my ethnic, um, where is my ethnic group coming from? Which, which uh, mosque I go to? What is the type, what type of Muslim I am? Or does my parents practice religion or not? Wasn't it, you know, we're yeah. a super educational society. And the only thing was dividing us wasn't even financial, 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 wow, financial <laughs> situation. <laughs> it was actually education. Oh, like imagine a country uh, for the level of education. It's like also when you say academia and non-academia, you can sense it in Arabic. We have the education, educated Arab speakers, and we have the non-educated. And that was the difference in Syria. Intellectual and non-intellectual. And money was never a question. So, And we had huge local resources that we were in. Like, you know, we never had, a, like, for example, here in Germany, we had a supermarket called Lidl. These like the big, huge ones. Uh, we never really went to one of those. We only had this local these supermarket. These little shops, we, right, sure. Exactly, like this local shop that we just go and buy everything, hygiene stuff and food and whatever, and just reach home. So it was very modern, but still local yeah. and basic society. Uh, we had free education. Till this moment, we still have free education. Give me a country in the Middle East. I don't know, outside of the Middle East. That you still, you can go from being like what from first for first class, and you graduate your masters for free. That's insane. In one of the best educational universities, and before post the war, we had so many people flying into Syria to get free education wow. from the Middle East and non Middle Easterns. You know, so we didn't get identified by by who we are. Only we get identified by our education. We get identified by the way we speak and think and our diversity um, from, because every city is different because, you know, we have also the Kurds, we had, uh, we had Palestinians, we had Sudanese, we had Armenian. So it's just such a mix that, and we never call them a refugees. We all are living under one roof. And I never, ever, ever myself, I my family, said to someone that they are refugees. I knew that there was the refugees camp, which like is an area where Palestinian society created their own community, but I never called them refugees. So, you know, like there was this big understanding society. Uh, and I grew up in an even better, um, I think every family has their own way of raising their own kids. And we, me and my sister Yisra, and we have a third sister, Shahad, we were freaking lucky. Mm. with our family mm. my parents and my grandparents and the other big family because my parents just so us differently you know when people says do not give a trust for a female my fam my family just say shut the fuck up i didn't ask you <laughs> amazing you know like yeah. so this is where the attitude is coming from yeah, yeah you know? i love it they they told us from the beginning that we were enough they told us from the beginning that we can dream and we're gonna make it happen and in the middle of the Middle East, you have two swimmers who are Muslims. And their parents are challenging whoever want to question my, my religion. You know what I mean? So I think growing up like that, it gave me this whole um, secured confidence in my body, in the way I speak, in the way I do. And then even my bigger family, they said, as long as your parents are 
there to to protect you and to be there never stop yeah you know my grandpa he he always says and he still say never stop swimming as long as your parents are in there to to be there for you so you know what i mean uh yeah so this is how i grew up in general in syria and so where did they all- where did they um that's interesting because yeah i put a lot of weight on you know parents have such a uh, unique responsibility they can literally not everything like kids are going to do their thing right kids are going to do their thing and sometimes it works out for the best and there's a lot of factors there but so much of it does rest back on how the parents interact with their children and where they get it from so where did it come from is this is this a is this a mardini like legacy like your your parents and you just mentioned your grand your grandfather so them and then his parents or how did the, do you know enough about your legacy to know like did somebody was it always that way or did somebody say no we've got to change like women are enough yeah. and, and all the like when did that happen no actually it wasn't legacy unfortunately um uh so the swimming legacy was a mardini okay it was always in a mardini you know uh but then the behavior it was my parents who broke the circle mm. you know my mom was she's grew up in a very feminist society and very feminist family but then also there was always those points where girl is not allowed to do so sure you know after marriage because in middle east i think uh, i believe that a girl when she's single and in her family house is a thing, but then when you move to your husband's house is another thing. Mm. And the way how I think about it. So my mom was super supportive all the time growing up as a single, you know, before she got married, but then when she got married, it changed a bit. And then raising, having three girls is even tougher, was it, on her? So my mom and my dad actually who broke the circle off because like, yeah, because my mom had the freedom before she got married and then she raised three kids and then she get married to a swimmer who actually gave her a different more freedoms, things that she didn't even know. Like my dad was a, taught my mom swimming and because of him, she became a swimming coach. Wow. So we, he gave us the freedoms that we didn't think like we are privileged enough to have, which then it's bringing you back. No, that's normal. You know, you can do that. So I think it's like exactly what I told you at the beginning. Every family has their own way. And then even when you have your own family, okay, you have your own family now, so it's a bit different. So I think it's just my parents. My yeah, parents that's beautiful. And I think it's a big part of it that my dad was an athlete. Yeah, where did that, so where did that come from swimming in particular? Because that's not like a normal, like swimming family isn't sort of a thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and your sister, you know, Yusra is an Olympic athlete. You're a professional, uh, you're a professional long distance swimmer. You just said your dad, so like in, in taught your mom and now your mom's a coach, like, where did that come from? Why swimming? And I say that because I am a, I'm not a water person. I, I am a, I'm a, I'm an okay swimmer, but I would die if I like, I could swim for a little bit. You know, I did, I did, uh, I tried to become when I was a teenager, it looked cool to be a lifeguard. Like it looked cool. You know, they're super cool. Still is so yeah, cool. Right? I'm lifeguard. Right? And so I try to take the test. Like I tried to train for the test in, the very first day we're in the pool, right? It's the first day, like like three days of training or whatever. And they had us do this thing where you tread water for like three or four minutes with just your feet, no hands, and then just your hands and no feet. And on the one, on the, with, I forget if it was first or second, but when they had us tread water with just feet and no hands, I literally sunk. Like, I was like, this is stupid. I got out of the pool and walked out of the room. Like I left right then. I was like, I'm not doing this. This is stupid. I'm, I'm going to be a terrible lifeguard. Anyway. So swimming, where did that come from? This is my dad again. Yeah. It's just a bunch of his friends. They just love swimming. Swim pool. And then, yeah, he went to the pool and he liked it. And then he met a good coach and he just made sure that my dad never leaves the swimming pool. So it was just like spontaneous kids, you know, summer, that, summer fun. That then became uh, like the love of his life. That then became this thing that he yes. wanted to pass on to yeah. you all. What do you, what do you love about swimming? Like, wh- what does it make you feel? Why do you do it? Swimming, swimming is, I think it for me, it organizes all my life. Mm. I know that might sound a bit weird or different, but when I'm swimming, you know, this idea of, of course, you're privileged sometimes to just want, it's privileged to say I want to be alone. Sure. 
so the fact that I could, you know, be alone and, and just focus. So like one of the things I think, I'm not sure if others did it. I, uh, I am the only one who in Syria did like 10 K in a swimming pool. Oh, wow. Then stop by the age of, I think I was 14 or 15. So that, the the mentality I had back there, now I'm aware of it. And I'm aware of, I'm like, shit, you know, like, how did I do yeah. that? Like, for example, one of the things that I, I, uh, I could do that's for the 10 K every 50 meter, I can sw- I, from the first one to the last one, I can swim the same exact number of seconds. Oh, wow. By the age of 14. You were super consistent. Like, imagine how much focus yeah. I had in the water, you know, every beat, every, like, the body, how I'm in, like, basically, we're saying three hours, three hours of swimming, I'm in charge of my body. And now when I'm like, you know what, I just get hyperactive from, like, stress in life. I'm like, how did I do that? Yeah, that's insane. And I think also being the, the, the movement with the water. You know, when you know how to deal with the water, the water is your best friend. Mm. And and then just the movement itself. It's be- swimming is beautiful. It's like dancing. Maybe I should give it another try someday. You should. I rarely, you should. I rarely maybe, get maybe the water. The, maybe you don't start with lifeguarding. No, no, no. Training. Maybe start no, no, no. with just I'm a, go into the pool. I'm a 37-year-old dad of three kids now there's no lifeguarding in my future but maybe i can you know get some i love how you're talking about it because it is it is a i have felt completely at home and completely in love being in the water at certain times in my life uh one of the things that one of the things that gave me a little fear so there's two things that gave me some fear of the water i don't enjoy swimming pools i think they're like weird and disgusting you know like and not, not the swimming pool that you were probably in, but like you know you go to a public swimming pool and like kids are yeah. pissing in it and stuff and but like <laughs> i did grow up loving bodies of water like the ocean and then there was one time so i grew up in guatemala and there was one time that i almost got carried out from the riptide and so i feared for my life like i had this like real like it was a genuine i'm gonna die like i was way too far out and i had to fight for my life to swim back in so that happened and then a couple of years later when I, in my mid my mid-teens i got stung by a portuguese man of war in the water and that hurt like hell and for like several days it was the most painful thing and so that was like oh I'm going to go into this body of water where I can't see what's going on below and I'm going to get stung again, or I'm going to, something's going to happen. So I think I got like a little fearful of it and I probably need to get over it. That's the bottom line. Yeah, actually I I have kind of similar experiences. So like coming to Europe and the story. Yeah. It took us very long time. Me and my used right? Like yep. the Olympic swimmer we're talking here and me with professional swimmers, I was up in water, long distance swimming. So like, that sea that I was in, it was exactly the one I was swimming in in Syria. But also, we needed some time. We need like a year to just like, well, we were in Lesbos walking by the shore. We like, you know, imagine that. And we know how to swim for a long time. So it's traumatic experiences. And I also so scared of not looking under. Yeah. Like, me. What's, what's down I was there? Like, I, was like, keep, I just keep my toes up. So, you know, like, even if you're perhaps a swimmer, it's always scary. Okay. <laughs> well, that gives me a little more confidence that you, the long distance <laughs> professional swimmer, still gets a little iffy about it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to see what's under there. So, 2000, 2015 rolls around, and you and your sister decide to leave Syria and, you know, try, try to get out. What was happening? Yeah that caused you both to say like we're leaving and we're going to make this hard dangerous journey that we might not survive right that's a that's a thing right the same year that you two left 800,000 refugees made the same journey 800 of them are missing or dead so we're, there's a 1% chance that you're not going to make it right um and then you know once you make the journey and and survive it then who knows what's going to happen right there's a i mean we're going to talk about refugee camps here in a little bit and so it's not a safe journey all around. So what made you, what were the circumstances that caused you both to say we're out? Um, we lost a lot of friends that or traveled. Um, we lost our family home. We weren't even able to go to school as a normal human beings anymore. Uh, there was completely nothing to be called a normal life. Yeah. 
And we reach a level where if we're going to leave home, you leave the house. And then after all this happened, we lived in a rental places. And so there's something in the Middle East that people doesn't know. We buy properties. We don't live in house for rent. Like this is a thing we get shocked when we come to Europe. Like everybody, yeah, nobody owns. owns, especially like in Berlin, nobody probably owns a home. I'm like, it's like everybody rents. You pay the rent for so many years. Yeah. Why? Just buy it, yeah. you know? So, this, so, and then we had to live in rental, um, uh, you know, housings or hotels, rooms or whatever, whatever, like anything that oh, we were very lucky. My family had savings, you know, mm. we we're fucked if they didn't. Yeah, sure. So, that was some that kind of uncertain stability. And after like having a home and having this stable life, and then suddenly you move into this uncertain situation. And but I think the most mostly it was because we couldn't swim anymore. Hmm. You know, I think I'm sure my sister Yusra shared the stories about how the swim pool was attacked, attacked so many times, right. and and then how we didn't go. So it was just unsafe to leave the fam like your house door. And every time we say goodbye to your mom um, or to my dad, we don't know if we're going to see them yep. again. And then we get to the point, I'm like, I don't need to live that way. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to end my life when the, that might sound super selfish. You know, I'm not going to, a lot of people say, your, our country is not a hotel. You leave it whenever you are not ready. Mm. That was just like a big quote that everybody shared it. And I'm like, but I'm going to leave it when the situation of that hotel is affecting my own dreams and my own future sure. plans. You know, I deserve to have a freedom and I deserve to have a life and to resume my education, at least, you know? Yeah. So I think that's where it's come from, that we couldn't just sit and wait the situation to get better. Because obviously... Let's look at it now. Yeah. You know, nothing is changing. Yeah. So that's where it's come from. It's that we deserve... And have a right to live like someone else, uh, everyone else is. So that's where it's come from. And Following our dreams, honestly. Yeah, I mean, in, in in user shared something very similar, and and I love that because, you know, there are, you know, you even you coming from a place of certain privilege growing up, where you did, you know, you, your parents had savings, all those things. There are certain people, no matter where you live, whether it's Syria or America, like people around me don't have. I might have that because I've worked hard for that and I'm working to build this thing for my family, but a lot of people don't have that. And so you have to recognize that some people um, can't up and go, they can't leave for whatever reason. And, but you and your sister resolved to have a better life, to lead a better life. And I love that resolve. I love that insistence on, I deserve better than this. I can have better than this. And now, you know, we'll come back to in a second, but fast forward, like we're seeing the fruits of that. We're seeing what, now that you're in a better place, you know, living in Germany, we're seeing what you, all the things that you learned growing up are causing you to do, right? You're not sitting on your ass, like just like living selfishly, right? You are serving and loving other people. And again, we'll get to that in a second, but you're accomplishing your dreams now. You didn't just get out and say, okay, now I'm going to just like exist. And then we, 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 we got new dreams that we didn't even know we we're able to reach. So uh, tell me about the journey. Your your journey is well documented, uh, you know, going across that body of water that, again, has claimed many lives that are trying to get across it. But what's mm. what's your version of that story? That was a pretty, like, harrowing experience. That was a pretty scary thing, right, to uh, try to get across this body of water to freedom, you know? So what was mm -hmm. it, what was that like when you were finally making that journey? Yeah, um, for me, I don't call it heroin. I think anyone is who want to really survive and have a life and they're in the situation, you need to fight for it, period. Uh, I believe anyone, if they're, like, I love everybody who say, I don't know how you could do it and how you did it. And I'm like, if you were in my shoes, yeah. you would have done the same. Yep. If you love your life and you want to stay alive, you would have done the same. Um, so this is uh, the famous story that I actually, I don't really like to repeat it a lot. <laughs> Because like you don't have to tell you know, it if you don't want to. I don't want to force you to share it because it is well documented. But share whatever you want, or we can skip it. You tell me. Yeah, I, I will share it okay. briefly. So the the yeah the the dinghy was overcrowded, and uh, we were twenty people. It was only me, Nusra, and a third girl, but everyone else was males and four years old child. 
And the story as it is that the, the boat was over overcrowded. So of course it's gonna sink. After five fifteen minutes, we left the shoreline. We start getting water in, and the engine stopped. So, and then you know everybody was thinking, okay, we don't want to die basically, and we don't want to go back to Turkey. Yeah. So uh, a guy, like a man on the boat, he stood up and said, okay, well, let's jump in the water, make it light from inside, but heavy from the side to stabilize it. Because it also, we left at 6 p.m., which is a bit stormy, a bit windy, and there was like a sun, sunset. So it was all the environmental um, elements not really helping. I was being, being like pushed front and far because like, yeah, you know, the sea and... When it's not happy, you're not going to make it yeah. that easily. So, yeah, he jumped. And you don't have time to decide. You know, it's a heartbeat. You just jump and do. Um, he jumped and then another guy jumped. And then I was like, okay, I don't think I'm going to sit and watch. Yeah. You know, I'm professional swimmer my whole life. Yeah. Stood up, I jumped. A second later, my sister jumped as well. And we kept all of us together, like exchanging places. Um for three and a half hours, and then we made it safely. But what is the heroin part of the story? That 50% of the people who jumped in the water and helped us, they weren't even able to swim. That's mm. the heroin side of the mm. story. That people were fighting for their life, not even knowing that the moment they're going to jump in the water, and if they lose yeah. the balance, yeah. they're dead. Yeah. You know, I know I can swim yeah. if anything happens. So I think that is the heroin part for me, that actually putting your life in a complete risk so you can actually somehow reach safety. So that was something I never saw before, mm. that you might die if you jump, and but you still did it because you just believe that my life is not important than the other 19 people on the boat or not important than these three people in the water. So I think all this... Getting together and just, you know, like, you know, when you have that voice in your head, don't do it or do it, you're going to die, whatever. When you're like, just say for that voice, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You just discover that you can do a lot. Yeah. And I think in this moment, the 20 people of us, we all were there. Yeah. And that's how we all made it together. It wasn't on the social media and the news, how it exploded. It was Sara Nustra who saved the sure. boat, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it wasn't like that. You know, we are at the end of the day, 20 and 17 years old girls. I cannot pull a boat full of 18 people. Right. That's impossible. Yeah. You know, the boat by itself, if I, it gets on top of me, I'm, I'm scratched. Like yeah. I'm smashed. Yeah. So it was, everybody worked together. And then we all 20 people, we didn't even need to talk. I think, the energy and, and and the need, you know, we needed safety, all of us. And we didn't want to give up and we didn't want to go back. So I think we pushed it far. We pushed it as far as could get. And then we made it safely. And we were very lucky. No one even was injured. That's a That's wild. Big luck. That's wild. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I love your version of the story. And user told a similar one because it doesn't, um, I love that you are pointing out, hey, it wasn't just us. And there were people yeah. and there were people that were risking more because I, I it could be easy. And I'm glad that's not you, but it could be easy to just go with the media's version of this. Right. Which is that you two save the day. And you, I think you are. You both are amazing. But but not just for that reason. And you weren't the ones that saved that day. It was a collective yeah, me, effort. Me, yeah. Let me say that that's the thing. Again, why the story went huge on social media, because we're two Syrian refugees who are Muslim and females. Yep. Yep. Which is like, the West is like, oh my God, all those together. And I'm like, bring me a German Christian two girls who is minors and do the same. It won't be a big deal. Yeah. But because we are the other, that's why it was a big story. Yep, you're exactly right. So, yeah, so th that's why people took that. And when we said it a hundred times, it wasn't just us, but yeah. of course no one cared. Yeah. Yeah. You, okay. you, 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 you two fit the perfect, I mean, you were the perfect picture of the other, the, the unexpected, wait, this could never happen. And then it did. Um, oh my God. They have women who in a hot swim. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's incredible. So you reach the shore, thank God. And what happens between then and you getting to Germany? What's that journey like? This journey was uh, the first day when we arrived at Action to Lesbos. We were like, 
we made it to Europe. The hard part was over. <laughs> not. And the, oops. Yeah. No way. To, we're not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I think being in the water, I think it was a bit easier because we weren't dealing with human attitude. <laughs> we're dealing with nature attitude. Uh, but yeah, I, this journey was between... So we took a ferry from Lesbos to Athens. And then from there, from Athens, was between bus riding, driving, uh, getting in the cars, trains, or even walking. Uh, and here when you start seeing the, the human being nature on the borders. And, and, and also some of us, like the refugees, you know, we get, to, so we get into so much frustration and that leads into conflict in some points. And at the end of the day, you're talking about 64 recognized nationality in one place. So, mm. you know, I might say something in, in, in American English might offend you, but then at the end of the day, I don't know because we're from different cultures. So imagine that, like, that's just something that never actually no one ever thinks about because they don't give a shit. Yeah. But you are putting so many nationalities in one border waiting for 18 hours, for example. And of course there will be conflict. And then they will say, look, it's like this picture of... Um, uh, Donald Trump when he was saying migrants will bring uh, crimes, drugs, yes, yes. And rapists, troubles. rapists, yeah, yeah, and he was like everybody's yes. I'm like, of course, if you're gonna put sixty nationality in one place, they don't even speak common yep. language, they're gonna fight. Yeah, period. Yep. Put six people in one room and they don't know how to talk to each other, they will fight. Yeah. So don't tell me uh, mediation and whatever, whatever. Like it's uh it's a whole projection of, of uh, the society into it. And then when that happens, when we get frustrated, then the cameras were super ready yeah. to transfer that. And then what politicians do is like, look, I told you so. They are strangers. We don't know how to deal with them. And then, of course, people get poisoned in their brain and mm. they, you know, fed up with it. And then they will attack us. Like we got that in uh, so many borders that we were attacked. We were hit and people call us like tourists and Islamic uh, saviors, whatever, whatever. So many things. But back then I was angry and I was very disappointed. But a year or so later, when I got into more into European politics and the society, I understand that it is not the civilians fault, no matter what they do, because at the end of the day, we all check the news and read a newspaper or have social media on our phone and you're going to listen what your politician is telling you because he's leading your country. So this is where it's coming from. Like the biggest one for me was Hungary. Hungary. Mm. Oh, I hated everything had to do with mm. it after because we were stuck for 10 days. People were attacking us. It was like, leave our country. I'm like, I want to leave. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be here. Them, let them, let them. I am not, I'm, trust you, I'm not happy of sleeping in a train tra uh, station. Let me go, you know? And then a civilian comes again into, I'm like, are you getting the idea? I'm telling you, I don't want to be here. Yeah. And we were stuck for 10 days. And uh, so, and then a year or so later, I was invited to give a talk there. And then I was angry. I'm going there. I was like, I'm going to give one of the worst speeches that I'm going to make people feel disgust by themselves. Yeah. And then I had two, three conversations with the youth there. And then it's just like, you know, when you like, yeah. Light bulb goes off. It just off. melts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, shit. Like it's, they didn't even know, but then the Hungarian government back then was covering their own political uh, crisis by pointing out yeah. the refugee crisis, which they saying that they want to come take your jobs, blah, 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 blah. And what I was saying, we want to pass. Yeah. Just, well, we're just passing. Yeah. And then when the buses were sent from Germany, we prove a point. There was none of the refugees left behind. Yeah. And I think people realized that, no, we're just passing by um but then the other ones yeah it was uh, like some of them were smooth some of them were not but hungary was one of the biggest stops that really affected us um but then the rest was more chiller there was some dramatic stories which we're not gonna get into details but every country had their own share which people can have like hours reading sure. about it in our book butterfly yes yes but that's the, that's the whole concept you know every country had their own fare yeah. You know. Did you um did you choose Berlin or what what ultimately led you to to choose or to move there? Was it was it where you had to go or what what attracted you to that city? 
Actually, Berlin chose us. <laughs> it was crazy. So we wanted to go to Hanover. Uh, I have a very good friend there. And she was the reason why in the first place also I wanted to leave because she left and I just couldn't, you know. Yeah. Uh, but my friend didn't take a journey, uh, like refugee's journey. She actually, her family applied years ago, uh, like back in 2010 for a visa in, in, to Germany. And then 2015, they answered and said, yes, you can come. And that's actually another thing that it's good that came up on that you asked this question, that it, being part of the Middle East, you don't have the freedom to travel around like how everyone is. Sure. Then everybody tells you why you don't take a visa. And I say, yo, I need two years if yeah. I get it. Yeah, sure. And I have very strict uh, you know, measures I have to follow. So it's not us who are choosing to be in this situation. Is the Western society putting very hard, you know, measures on us to do? For example, someone tells you if you want to apply for an American visa, you need to at least have 20 grants in your bank account. Be like, I'm just 16. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So, and then this is an answer for people when they say, why don't you take a flight? Well, here you go. <laughs> Give me the flight, I would take it. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, and then in 2015, five years later, the German government emailed them and said, you can come and have your visa. And then they moved, and then that's why I wanted to go. But then when you come, uh, when you register in the asylum uh, migration office, the, they decide where you would go. Got it. And then we were chosen in Berlin. We didn't want to stay here. We were so sad. Like, we wanted to leave and because we came with a big group on the road. And we wanted to stick together as a family, but then we were chosen to be here. And I think a year or so later, we started realizing how great it is to be part of Berlin. And we're lucky, actually, to be a part of Berlin. That's beautiful. It took me, it took me five years, yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you think you'll, do you still have to stay? Are you there by choice now? Or do you think you'll move on somewhere else? Uh, I'm actually not by choice. I mean... We can say choice and not in the sure. same time. We still have to live in Germany, not in Berlin. Got in particular it. For, so we get citizenship and then you just become then a European. You, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can move anywhere in the EU. Yeah, exactly. But I think I'll stay in Berlin. I think it's just like, if I want to have a family, I think Berlin is one of the... Yeah, it's a wonderful place. You know, great societies for, for that, yeah. So you, uh, 2015, when you and your sister crossed, you know, that body of water to get freedom, that wasn't the last time you've been in the news. Uh, you've been in the news quite a bit. Um, and not always for good things. And I'm using good things in quotations because, <laughs> you know, there. so let's go back a couple of years. In 2018, you were arrested along with your friend, uh, is it Sean? I think his name? Yeah, Sean Binder. Yeah. Yeah. Sean Binder. Um, I know what you were arrested for, but tell everybody what you were arrested for and, and why. Like, why were you... Because you were you were headed to the airport and all of a sudden you're surrounded by officers, right? I mean, people... Most people only see this shit in a movie, right? Like, you're walking mm-hmm. through the airport and all of a sudden, boom, you're surrounded. That actually happened to you. So what was... What were you involved in? What was going on that, that led to that point? Um, back then, I didn't know. They just came to me in the airport and said, uh, I was flying back to Berlin and they said, we wanted to come for a couple of questions and we, you're going to fly back to Berlin tonight. Don't worry. And everything is under control. I'm like, yeah, sure. I went with them. And then a couple of hours later, you know, I was in the airport. I had a dinner, goodbye dinner for me with my team. Fucking hangover. Yeah. Very cold. I'm like, I just want to be home, you know? So somehow my I had two of my best friends with me in the airport when this happened. So I told them to call my team and say what's happened because if I didn't inform them, my team would think I'm in Berlin already. And then so they brought me Sean to bring me food and bring me a jacket and just to be with me in there. And then the police didn't allow Sean to leave. And we're like, okay, what's going on? Like, and then I realized there was something off. Every time I say I want to use the bathroom, a police officer come with me and waits by the door. And I'm like, you know, there's something weird. Yeah, you, like, you, said, like, you said I was going to answer a few questions. This is weird. Yeah, like why I'm being watched, you know, why I'm stuck on a chair for five hours. And then a lawyer from our team comes in and says, we have to go to the courthouse and testify, la, la, la. Still didn't understand what's going on until when we just thought it's like, 
casual police checking or whatever till a police officer came with a handcuff mm. and asked me and Sean to raise our hands up. And we're like, you know, what? like you've never been in a situation. And it's just someone casually say, give me your hand. I want to handcuff it. So like it started to like, okay, so many more questions. So he handcuffed us to each other. We go to the courthouse and then all our friends were there. We testified for like two hours each. Um, I've been asked about everything in my life. Um, after that, they, uh, after like we testify, we go back inside again. And then the judge says that you are accused of being part of criminal organization, money laundering, espionage, um, trafficking, smuggling. And recently, like a couple months ago, they added fraud. And all of that, I mean, of course, you're like, me? <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, like, if I knew that I've done those things, you know, I won't be surprised. As I laugh all the time when I talk about it, because for me now, it's a joke. Yeah. I cannot. I no, just, nobody I nobody ever thing. imagines that's going to happen to them. Yeah, like, you know, I always tell my friend, I'm missing out. Prostitution? Weapons. And then I have all this, like, biggest heavy crimes in the world. Like, what else? Yeah, Definitely. right. So, um, and then the big shock was that she said, you have to stay uh, detained till the trial. And here I lost my shit, you know, because I was ready to come home, continue my education. Yeah. And I closed the chapter with degrees. And it's crazy because every month when I say I'm going home, I always extend my staying. And the only time I actually wanted to leave, Lesbos was like, I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> so it was, it was a big shock. I was in denial. I, I didn't want to accept the fact that I'm going to be in prison. I thought that I still thought that I, I'm going home until when I, they came and transferred me to the main prison in Athens. And here I was like, I'm not going anywhere soon. Um, and the reason behind those charges is as simple as because we were helping refugees. Yeah. We didn't do any of these charges. There's no evidence against us. Some of the charges, um, that they are like supporting your argument on it. I was in my classroom in Berlin. Sean was in his graduation in London. And they are saying we were in that day on that time smuggling people. And I'm like, just bear with me. How am I going to do that while I'm in Berlin in my classroom? Yeah. Or Sean taking his diploma. So like there's no base for the whole yeah. basis. And it's all about criminalizing humanitarians. But unfortunately, a month later... When the press worked on the story, we did a press release. We that was like our biggest, um, what do you call it, like um, plan to go forward with that. I think the Greek government was like, "Oops, you know, they they, they made a mistake this yeah. time," because we are not just random people who are like volunteering. I don't mean like because my my boat story and I think this background it showed very clearly that I have not, like, how would you accuse a refugee of being a smuggler? Yeah. Yeah. Someone who been through it themselves. Why would they smuggle someone else? Yeah. So, uh, um, we, we got detained for three months and a half and we were released on bail. And since then till now we're waiting, there's nothing changed. And if it were proven innocent or proven guilty, we have to spend 25 years in prison and I'm 25. <laughs> you know how my life, I would spend the rest of it in there. So, okay, let's back up here a second. Why are, yeah. why would a government want to criminalize humanitarian work? What's behind that? Because I believe if we leave, because, okay, the humanitarian field and the humanitarians in Greece in particular, they are they doing the job that the government should do, period. Look to Lesbos right now. And then if we step forward, they cannot do the work without us. Yeah. And because we're doing the work, other governments are backing up from supporting Greece. Sure. Because we are filling up the gaps. Interesting. So, so their idea is, okay, if Greece doesn't help the refugees, and if they make sure that we all go away, and how they do make, want to make sure that we all go away but by scaring us off by criminalizing us, by prisoning us, by saying, if you stay by the shoreline, you are actually going to be detained and by banning us. I'm banned from Greece now since two years. So 
And my whole, my, I have one statement for this answer. I was asked by the BBC what I think about it. And I said, back, oh, and they believe, which is more funny, they believe that refugees come to Europe and to the shorelines because they know someone like me and Sean are on the shoreline there to give them water and blanket and medical support. And for me, I was like, when I came in 2015 with my sister, I didn't even know that there is something called volunteers or search and rescue swimmers or anyone will be there on the shoreline. And we didn't have anyone on the shoreline, by the way. Yeah. So you're telling me that I'm leaving my homeland, putting myself and my family in a dinghy, putting myself in danger for a fucking water bottle and a blanket? Yeah. Yeah. Which it's not, of course, but this is how they, again, we go back yeah. to the public and the ideas. But deep behind, we all know the reason. But then again, let me put this in the people's mind. Let people hate the criminal and hate the activists and push them away and make sure no one is working their job. And of course, by growing the fascist parties. So this is, you know what I mean? It's just, it's another way that Europe want to stop supporting refugees. But instead of doing it, they're using us, the volunteers, by saying we are smuggling them. We are bringing them in. And we are the reason there are corruption in Greece right now. Because we are there. But of course it's not. You know? Oh, God. Yeah, we could. Yes. No, it's not that at all. Um, I have a lot we could I have a lot to say here, but I, I won't. Um, how do you feel like I can't even imagine how it feels to, you know, you spent 105 days uh, detained, got out on bail. That was a couple of years ago now. Um, and you're just waiting around. Like, how does that feel? How do you how are you keeping yourself um, encouraged and moving forward? with this kind of looming over your head. I mean, literally potentially. And here's the thing is like, you can't just say, because I, you can't just say, well, I'm not guilty of it. So I'm not going to prison. Cause that's just not how it works. Like the, no, it does, the, the unfortunately, I mean, it if you look yeah. at our ridiculous prison system here in the U S like most of the people in there are not guilty or they're not guilty of the extreme punishment that they were giving. So you can't just say, you can't sit there and say, well, I didn't do it. So I'm not going to prison. That's just not how it fucking works. You could actually end yeah. up there. So how do you yeah. feel? Um, it's tough. It was a very tough journey. Seriously. Um, now I'm back. Now, like we're talking about March um, when I started therapy. But the last year was shit. It was yeah. dark, you know. I, ha- I suffered from a dementia. I suffered from depression. I suffered from PTSD. And it was even worse because I'm a high ADHD. So yeah. You know how you get lost with this all these emotions, not even knowing that you have it. I tried to overdose and to suicide mm. so many times last year mm. because I got to the level I um, didn't know what was going on with me. I just didn't couldn't deal what was going on. And, and also at some point, it wasn't even done yet because then when we made it back home, I became the hero and my friend Sean became the criminal. Sean was su- suffering... He was jobless for two years. Still, he is till today. People, they didn't want to accept him. They didn't want to see him as a hero because he is not a refugee. And then it came again on me that I became this face that, oh, she is doing it. Which, in the first place, actually, I went to Greece because part of it, I was too much pressured by the first story. That I'm not what you're talking about me. I'm not the press. I'm not the Sarah Mardini or the sister of Yusra Mardini. And she's not Yusra Mardini only, you know. At the end of the day, we're people who's just following their dreams. Yeah. And we want to have a safe environment to operate th- the best way we can. But then again, political pressure and then again, the public pressure. And then I decided to start therapy. And then I just put it on public. After I started therapy, I wrote big posts explaining that part of my mental suffer wasn't not only what happened to me, it was the public themselves, you know, like, because it's so sad that now we take humanitarians and volunteers seriously after they've been criminalized. Before people always say they go to Greece or they go to volunteer because they're trying to find their love life partners or they have so much time and they don't want to how how they don't know how to spend it. Or we are just a bunch of hippies smoking weed every day. So we weren't taken seriously. Mm. And then after all that, suddenly we became in the picture. And then the society wants to decide how we should talk and we should not, because somehow they think we are not even educated enough to speak up for ourselves. And then suddenly, you know, you became that face again. So it was tough. It was very tough. 
But for me, what keeps me going, I have a strong, strong, strong legal team. And believe it or not, I build a legacy for yeah. being in prison. Yeah. Because I was taken away from the public eye and then others stepped forward. And I, I, when I was in Greece, no one even knew that I was in Greece. It was super private. And I was just operating quietly. I was so happy in my life. And then when I was in prison, the refugees themselves spoke up. Enough is enough. She's our sister, you know? And then because of that, I I got the empowerment and oh, shit. Someone's called. Uh, yeah, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can't see you, but Perfect. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm just going to continue talking because someone is calling me. No worries. I'm not going to press something wrong. So, yeah, I think now it's back. There Perfect. So, yeah, but I think what gave me going, I, I would say it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop. Yeah. And I'm going to sue the Greek government. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure the history says, for once, an Arab Syrian refugee Syrian uh, female sue the Greek government. Fuck yeah. So that's what keeps me going because I'm not going to stop till I got the justice. Yeah. And I know there is no justice, but I'm not going to stop. Uh, you know, because it's enough is enough. And I don't need someone to speak up for me. I have a big mouth that I can speak forever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, you can. I, I mean... First of all, I want to say that, like, I'm so sorry that you, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an accident that we're speaking now, you know, during, uh, suicide, Preven world suicide prevention, uh, awareness month. Um, yesterday was suicide prevention awareness day. Um, mm. a year ago yesterday, I lost a good friend to suicide. 10 months ago, I lost my best friend to suicide. I've had three siblings that have attempted suicide. Thank God they're all still here. Like, we don't, if people were following you in your story, they, they just see this like strong woman, right? Mm. And I think it's important to talk about the demons a little bit. I think it's important of course. to say like, yes, I've done all these things. I'm going to, you know, one day I'm going to sue the fucking Grecian government. Like I'm going to get justice for this, but none of that is easy. And oh, I tried to take my life in overdose last year because it's got so much. It's got so heavy. Like that's yeah. so important because of course, no, we, we, we are so hell bent on putting our best foot forward and so hell bent on, you know, giving our highlight reel, you know, all the best things that are happening, you know, especially in this age of social media, which is just fucking us up so badly. It's so good and so bad all at the same time. And we've got to realize that we all need each other. You need your therapists. You need your strong legal team to be able to, you've got these dreams, right? And they've shifted, as, as you said, they've shifted and changed and morphed over the years. But you've got these dreams that you're going to accomplish. And I have every, I have every bit of confidence that you're going to do it. But you can't do it alone. And there's some pretty low times. There's some really low times when you thought there were times last year after overcoming so much that you got to the point where you thought it might just be better to go. Just go, just leave it all, right? And that's, I'm sorry that you felt that way. I'm sorry you didn't feel supported by your community and the countries that are hosting you and the countries that you are fighting for. I mean, you're still, like you, like Greece for a short time received you as a refugee and then you went back. Like you literally were arrested while helping refugees. Like one of the great mysteries of life, uh, Sarah, is why horrible things happen to good people. Like why you and Sean serving people, loving people, trying to help people, this happens to you. And yeah. why um, very powerful people like Donald Trump are verified criminals. They have been committing crime their entire lives and they are running the free world. Like mm. that to me is a great mystery in life that I don't, I, I, I'm a Christian. And I still can't reconcile it. I'm a Christian and I let, still can't figure out like what the fuck is going on. Yeah, let me tell you why. Because it's our fault. It's our fault. We are responsible for that because when, okay, how did he get in power? Election. Sure. Period. Yep. Go back to Europe. Same. Go back to Syria. Same. Because we don't really overthink our decisions before we put it out there. Okay, he give you some, uh, you know, promises. Yeah, I will do it. That's it. So true. You know, we don't really think, we think that as long as we are maintaining um, 
some ground rules in our family house, we won't be affected by the outside. But no, honey, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know? So so I think that that's the rules that we are not thinking. It's again, we're not thinking outside of our own bubble. Yep. yep. Yeah, we're not thinking. So, we're not again, we're not thinking my decision here, the, the vote that I'm casting is going to affect a lot more than just my place where I live, where I yeah. stay. Um, yeah. Cause, cause what, what we're deciding in America actually affects you in Germany to some extent. And the, the votes and the decisions you all make as a community actually affect us in certain ways. Um, yeah. It just still is. And I, I agree with you. I agree with you. We need to think more compassionately and more broadly mm-hmm. when we make these decisions but it's still, at the end of the day, even with that being very true, it still just boggles my mind that I'm sitting here talking with you. You have a potential 25-year prison sentence looming over your head. And yet there's so many powerful, privileged people that are walking around free. And they're just, they're horrible people. They're criminals, right? And you were arrested. Exactly. You were arrested literally in the middle of helping people, serving people yeah. That, that, yeah. that are currently going through what you went through you know, just a few short mm. years ago and are still going through in so many ways. Um, it's wild. So, yeah, but also I believe it's happened for a reason. Agreed. Because I believe that hundreds and hundreds of refugees are rotting in there and people who is not actually guilty. And when I'm being proven innocent, then I can, you know, they, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It's true. Um, so present day, uh, yes. you said you haven't been I guess you probably can't go back to that refugee camp to, to, um, is it, is it Les, uh, Lesbos? Is that what it's called? Yeah. To the, in the, um, yeah. Camp, camp Moria. Yeah. So basically the, gov- <laughs> the Greek government said, I would threat to the national security. Oh my God. Yeah. You're such, so, you're <laughs> such a threat. I feel so threatened right now. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I cannot laugh when I say it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's been two years since I'm banned. Uh, I had so many trials that, I had in 21st of May, I had in 2nd of September, and I have now in 17th of September. And I keep postponing that. So, um, yeah, an Amoria refugee camp it does not exist anymore now. No. So, yeah. So, literally, what's going on right now? I've been, you know, I've been following your social media feed the last few days. Like, everything feels so intense right now. But specifically in Camp Moria, like, what's going on there right now? So, on... Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning, there was a fire set on. I don't know the reasons, but I could know what are the reasons that you are living in, let's call it a bunker, where there's trash, there's uh, no hygiene uh, items, there's no health. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but everything, there's well, nothing. You, you, uh, nothing. Uh, yeah, let me just quote something you said of the new humanitarian a while back. You said you have, and, and I've, I've been, like, I, I know this. A lot of people don't know because they're just willfully ignorant. They don't want to go investigate. But you said this. You said you have people who are dying, living in a four-meter tent with seven relatives, limited access to water, hygiene is zero, privacy is zero, security is zero, children's rights, zero, human rights, zero. You feel useless. You feel very useless. Like it is a place where, and I, I have another friend uh, who they're, they're from, they're from Iraq and they're refugees and they, they went through a uh, refugee camp and her brother actually died. Her brother died there, like was murdered in the camp. And she just recalls these horrible, horrible situations. So keep going. But I just wanted to quote you your own words about like, this is a, this is not a fun place to be. And some, some refugees spend not just months in years, but years. decades in these yeah. camps because they have no fucking where to go exactly exactly um and then yeah the fire started and then it's there was the first fire actually destroyed so there's 12 section and i think it's destroyed like around uh nine sections of the whole place wow. and then sadly oh yeah and then what happened that all the refugees had to evacuate yeah, so there's 12, 13,000 refugees that didn't have a 13, place to go yeah. before, and now they really don't have a place to go. Exactly. So they had to evacuate organizations, help them, la, la, la. And the fire department didn't help. The police didn't help. They attacked them with a tear gas. And instead of helping them to escape, they were actually helping They attacked criminals the again. refugees with tear gas? Yeah. Yeah, and the volunteers, fascists went out on the streets, and I have a friend 
that she did an interview um uh, it's called, uh, her organization called Youth for Humanity campaign. She said that they had to ha- hide for 45 minutes in a car because the fascists were attacking them and their medical team. So we're talking about doctors, basically. So it was everything breaking out together. And then on Wednesday morning, Wednesday midday, there was a second fire that destroyed My God. all the other sections. And there was only one section left. But anyway, the camp on, it's gone. on the ground now is ash. Like It's completely ash. And people are leave, sleeping in the cemeteries, sleeping on the highway sites. They're not even allowed to be around uh, any other refugees camps. Um, and all the NGOs, we're back to ground zero. We're asking for funding, water, blankets, shelter, medication, baby milk, diapers. We're back to 2015. All the work that's been done for five years. Gone. It's crazy. And it's just crazier Literally an hour, like a day before, I had a Deutsche Villa interview and I was exactly saying the same. And then it happened. It happened. So, um, and it, it's, it's devastating. It's devastating. Like, I didn't sleep since I heard about it. I can't rest. We can't sit. And, you know, also, what is worse, you know, I can't even be there. Yeah, you can't go. I would because just you're fly a, there right away. Right, right. That's wild. So you said that some of them are sleeping in cemeteries, and this most of them, yes. This I posted today the the photos as well. Okay, yeah, it's wild that they're. And I actually I made a statement. I said, uh, "What did I say? That's um, that's the underground. The underground mercy is more honorable than uh, than Earth living." Uh, the underground mercy is more earnable than the living. Yeah, they're getting more. The es- essentially, they're getting more help from the dead than they yeah. than they are from people that are alive. I, I I cannot really get around this. How could you live in a cemetery? Yeah, like sleep in a. I freak out if I just pass one. Yeah, and like they're having to live there right now. Yeah. It, but again, it's you don't have a choice, right? I. I uh, have you heard this poem from Warson Shire called Home? I'm sure you maybe you have. It's a it, she she she's a refugee as well, and the, you should go look it up. I'll send it to you later, um, or just go look up Warson Shire Home. But some very pointed statements in there. Multiple times I've thought about it as we've been talking. You know, she starts out by saying, "No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well." Um, it's 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 quite the poem. Every time I read it, I get like super choked up. But she, it's this whole long thing, and then she ends with, "No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here.'" Right? Like the the refugees that were living in the already dire circumstances of Camp Moria are now mm-hmm. are now refugees from their refugee home. Right? Like once again, they've been told you have to leave now. You're not yes. safe here, right? Liter- literal leave fire. Where? So you have to leave now. Again, they're being told that. Yeah. I I hate this. I hate this. I, I it's. I mean, again, I don't. I, I don't think it's an accident that you and I are speaking today uh, for a lot of reasons. But one of them is the very place that you got kicked out of, the very place where you're now a national threat. Um, and I did see. I, I've been looking up a few different. And it's crazy. I'm doing the biggest campaigns to support that place again. Right. I've seen. Again, I'll point people to social media to to show them like that. Even though you can't go, you're continuing to find ways to help them. It's my home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a place that rescued you, and now you're trying to rescue others. Um, what are you excited about right now? I mean, I know this is that's a that's a terrible question right now, but like, what are you? I know that you have, I mean, the Camp Moria is burnt to the ground. You're trying to figure out a help there. You are waiting on this trial where there's a 25 year prison sentence looming over your head. What are, what's keeping you going? In other words, like what is keeping you going? What are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? If, if anything. So um, there's something, it's one of my titles is uh, making the invisible visible. People call me the eye and bridging. That's my thing. Yep. You know, Sarah, communication bridging. Yep. So something I'm pretty, it's keeping me going that also, it's sad, the tragedy would happen in Greece, but the way how we all, the humanitarian field, just got together and like, we had a demonstration organized in three hours in Berlin, 10K showed up. I was like, whoa. Insane. You know? 
in a couple hours. Something else, what I'm trying to do, actually, I'm trying to bring LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, Underground Berlin, and Humanitarian Berlin together to create one huge demonstration. We're going to be, like, we resist by music, basically, I want to call it. And that we're going to have a party starting from even Friday evening till Monday morning with, like, I have over 40 DJ volunteers to play. Amazing. And we're trying to find a space for all of these people. And then we just want to raise the biggest amount of donations that we could have. And that's what I'm keeping me going for now. And then later, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, one thing at a time, right? Um, exactly. What you just mentioned is no small undertaking, you know, pre- pre- yeah. preparing this sort of resistance event to... Um, and I love the kinds of people you're bringing together too, right? I think you and I, this conversation has shown that, you know, we are doing totally different things, but we're also doing the same thing. Like people have always talked about me and my work as, uh, yeah, the br- really bringing stories to light that no one's talking about and bringing, I mean, you're, okay. you're one of them. Like I want everybody listening to this podcast to now be obsessed with Sarah Mardini and like what Sarah's doing and like, how can we get on board and how can we help? Like I am so committed to, uh, bringing these stories to light because it's so important. We get so obsessed with famous people doing famous things, right? And I hate yeah. that. Oh, I hate that. Yes. Celebrity culture. Yes. Like, and, and, and if you look at who I've had on the show, like I know a lot of famous people and I've brought famous people on the show to talk about the things they're doing. But I literally told my podcast team the other day, they said like, what's like, let's work on the next season. What are you excited about? And I said, I want to continue to make Let's Give a Damn a place where people can come to find out what no one's talking about. Yes, I bring on famous people from time to time to bring in more eyeballs and to bring in more ears, right? Because they do bring in different people, right? So I'm excited to talk to them still. They're wonderful people, but I am way more excited. Like I'm so more, so much more excited talking to you about the things that you're doing in Germany, in Greece, this, this, this whole incredible story, then I am talking to the Chelsea Clintons of the world and the, the actors that I've gotten to talk to and the big musicians. Like that is just a means to an end. And I hope if any of them are listening right now, I love you and I think your story is important. But with all the privilege and with all the money and stuff that you have, you better sure as hell be doing something with it. Yes. And you have people like yourself and like many other people that don't have those resources that have been antagonized and persecuted by the government and otherwise. And you're still saying, fuck it. Like I'm doing this. Like I'm going to keep doing this. Um, Yeah. Which I think that's where their part should come because for so many years, so many people think that they cannot make a change because I do not have that authority, which is wrong. Totally wrong. Yeah, so that's I think that's where the part comes from. Yeah. That we want them to break it down for others because just people think that you were born that way and you had all this authority and you had, but no, we all went same step by step to reach where we are, you know. So that's what their responsibility come. That stop making it look difficult yeah. for people like us to do it. Yep, it's so easy. It's so easy. You just have to stop making excuses. You have to get to work. I'm writing a book. Yes. I'm writing a book right now for Let's Give a Damn. And most of it is going to be in different creative ways, trying to tell people it's so much easier. Like you can do it today. You can give a damn today. You can start now. Just stop making excuses for how hard it is, or I don't have time, or I don't have money, I don't have the resources. Like, fuck all of that. You can do it today. Like, start, get going. And before you know it, you'll be accomplishing your wildest dreams. You really will. Like you'll be doing all of these things that you never thought you could be doing. And um, yeah. so you're you're an example of that. So I really appreciate Thank you. I really appreciate you yeah. sharing your story and your time with us today. Um, Thank you for having me. Actually, I just received it. I, I was reading while we're talking. I have to be in Amsterdam demonstration tomorrow <laughs> to give a speech. Well, I have to fly out tonight. So... We're all like, Ta-da! amazing, amazing. Well, w- w- uh, I assume sending people to your Instagram is the Instagram. best way to keep in touch with you. So give give them your username. Yes. I'll also put it in the show notes. But what is your username? It's there? just Sarah Mardini. If they type that yes. in, it'll it'll pop right up. Yes, right away. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I would love. Thank to, you so much for having me. I would me. love to keep in touch. I'm going to keep tabs with you on social media, and we'll do this again. Uh, a year or two from now yes. whenever you've done yes. so much more than you've already done so thank you thank you for having me and that's the show today friends a massive thanks to sarah mardini for joining me for joining us on the show today we have so much to learn from her 
I sure hope you'll visit letsgiveadam.fm for more resources and links on this topic and about this guest. And thank you all for listening. Seriously, I'm honored that you listen to these conversations week after week after week. I created this show. Chad Snavely produced it. Let's Give a Damn is part of the Matter Media family. And you can reach out to me anytime and for any reason at hello at letsgiveadam.com. Sending so much love and light to each one of you. Stay safe. Keep giving a damn. Bye for now.